Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. We carry forward our discussion on the Indian Evidence Act. So, part B or part 2 of the Indian Evidence Act deals with proof. So, it has uh, chapter 3, facts which need not be proved. So, if there are any facts, if there are any documents or any evidences, then there are certain of them that have to be proved before the court of law. And there are certain other evidences or certain other facts that do not have to be proved in the court of law. The court shall, uh, shall presume that they are correct. And this chapter deals with those things. So, section 56 deals with fact judicially noticeable need not be proved. No fact of which the court will take judicial notice need to be proved. What does it mean? It means that there are certain facts that are defined to be judicially noticeable and we will look at what are these judicially noticeable facts uh, in a short while. But the, the thing is that if there is a fact that is judicially noticeable, then it need not be proved in the court of law. It will be presumed to be correct. So, what are these judicially noticeable facts? Facts of which court must take judicial notice the court shall take judicial notice of the following facts. So when it says the court shall take, it means the court must take, the court has to take judicial notice of the following facts. First is all laws enforced in the territory of India. So if there is a law that is enforced in the territory of India, the court is not going to see whether that law is correct or not. It will presume it to be correct. All public acts passed or hereafter to be passed by Parliament of the United Kingdom and all local and personal acts directed by the Parliament of United Kingdom to be judicially noticed. Now here the references are to the Parliament of the United Kingdom because the Indian Evidence Act dates back to the 1870s. Today these references are deemed to mean the Parliament of India. So all public acts passed or hereafter to be passed by the Parliament they are to be taken judicial notice. Articles of war of the Indian Army, Navy or Air Force, they again have to be taken judicial notice of, they do not have to be proved. The course of proceeding of the Parliament, of the Constituent Assembly of India, of Parliament and of legislatures established under any laws for the time being in force. So all of these have to be taken judicial notice of. Other things include things like the existence, title and national flag of every state or sovereign recognized by the government of India. Now, in this context, state means a nation. So, the existence, title and national flag of every nation or sovereign that is recognized by the government of India, it has to be taken a judicial notice of. The divisions of time, the geographical divisions of the world and public festivals, fasts and holidays notified in the official gazette. The territories under the dominion of the government of India. Now, it means the territories in the government of India. The commencement, continuation, continuance and termination of hostilities between the government of India and any other state or body of persons. So, all of these are different facts that do not have to be proved in the court of law. The court shall presume them to be true. They do not have to be proved. Now, it further states in all these cases and also on all matters of public history, literature, science or art, the court may resort for its aid to appropriate books or documents of reference. So, in this case what is happening is, if there is a law that has been passed, so the court will take this law to be true. But then which is the authentic version of this law? For that the court may refer to any books or documents that it considers fit. And similarly, for all of these matters of things like public history, literature, science, art, the court may resort for its aid 
to appropriate books or documents of reference. If the court is called upon by any person to take judicial notice of any fact, it may refuse to do so, unless and until such person produces any such book or document as it may consider necessary to enable it to do so. That is, if you go to the court and you ask the court to take judicial notice of something, then it is in the power of the court to either accept this request or to reject this request. The court may refuse to take judicial notice of the fact till you are able to produce such book or document that the court considers necessary to enable it to do so. So, only in those cases it will take judicial notice. Now, section 58 says facts admitted need not be proved. Now, in the last lecture we looked at what does admission mean? Who can admit to certain facts? Now, section 58 says if there are facts that have been admitted, then they need not be proved if this happens. No fact need be proved in any proceeding where the parties thereto or their agents agree to admit at the hearing or which before the hearing they agree to admit by any writing under their hands or which by any rule of pleading in force at the time they are deemed to have admitted by their pleadings. That is if somebody has admitted to a fact then it need not be proved again in the court because you have already admitted it provided that the court may in its discretion require the facts admitted to be proved otherwise than by such admissions. Meaning that if you have admitted something, admitted a fact to the court, then the court will not ask you to prove it again. But the court may ask for a third party evidence of the same fact. So for example, if you say that on this date and at this time I was in Kanpur. So the court will not ask you to admit uh, or to prove that you were in Kanpur, but the court or, or to prove this particular statement. But the court may ask for a third party proof of the same thing. So do you have any tickets to prove that? So that the court can ask. But if there is a fact that has been admitted in the proceeding, either in writing, either before the, uh, the hearing or during the hearing, or whether it is uh, in writing of the person or by the agent. So, those facts that have been admitted, they need not be proved. Then chapter 4 talks about oral evidence. Section 59 says, proof of facts by oral evidence. And all facts except the contents of documents or electronic records may be proved by oral evidence. That is, except in the case of documents and electronic records, all the facts may be proved by oral evidence. Now, what is oral evidence and what are the qualities of oral evidence? The oral evidence must be direct. So, oral evidence means that it is said orally. It is not a documentary evidence. It is, it has been perceived by certain senses and then we call it an oral evidence as against an evidence that is there in a document. Now, this section is saying that if the court is to admit an oral evidence, then it must be direct evidence. So, what is a direct versus indirect evidence? Direct evidence means that if it refers to a fact which could have, which could be seen, it must be the evidence of a witness who says he saw it. That is, if I have seen something, then my oral evidence will be taken in the court of law. Because I will say that, okay, I saw this person running at this point of time. But if I told this to my neighbor, so the statement of the neighbor will not be taken. So the statement will not come to the court and say that I have heard Ankur say that he has seen this person running away. Because in that case, it will become an indirect evidence. So if I have seen it, I have to say it. If my neighbor has seen it, my neighbor has to say it. So, that is the meaning of direct evidence. If it refers to a fact which could be seen, then it must be the evidence of a witness who says he saw it. The person who has seen it has to say it. If it refers to a fact which could be heard, it must be the evidence of a witness who says he heard it. So, who has heard it will give the evidence. If it refers to a fact which could be perceived by any other sense 
or in any other manner it must be the evidence of a witness who says he perceived it by that sense or in that manner if it refers to an opinion or to the grounds on which that opinion is held it must be the evidence of the person who holds that opinion on those grounds you cannot take evidence from another person provided that the opinions of experts expressed in any treatise that is a book commonly offered for sale and the grounds on which such opinions are held may be proved by the production of such treatises if the author is dead or cannot be found or has become incapable of giving evidence or cannot be called as a witness without an amount of delay or expense which the court regards as unreasonable so in these situations the opinion as has been written in the uh, treaty uh, in the treaties it can be used as a, an evidence to be proved provided also that if oral evidence refers to the existence or condition of any material thing other than a document the court may if it thinks fit require the production of such material thing for its inspection so the court can also ask to bring that material thing for the inspection in the court so this is all about the oral evidence so the main thing about oral evidence is that everything other than a documentary evidence or an or an electronic evidence may be proved using an oral evidence but the thing is the person who has seen saw heard or perceived something he or she has to give a direct evidence to the court it should not be indirect that is re referred to by somebody else then chapter 5 deals with documentary evidence proof of contents of documents the contents of documents may be proved either by primary or by secondary evidence now in the case of documents the court may use either the primary evidence or the secondary evidence so what are these primary evidence is defined in section 62 primary evidence means the document itself produced for the inspection of the court that is if a deed has been signed and if the original deed is brought to the court for the inspection of the court we'll say that it is a primary evidence but if a photocopy of the deed is brought then we'll say that it is a secondary evidence so this is primary evidence primary evidence means the document itself produced for inspection of the court where a document is executed in several parts each part is a primary evidence of the document where a document is executed in counterpart each counterpart being executed by one or some of the parties only each counterpart is primary evidence as against the parties executing it so if there is a deed that was signed at one place by one person and was signed at another place by another person in two different copies so each of these copies will be taken as a primary evidence against the person who has signed it who has executed it is what is referred to here each counterpart being executed by one or some of the parties only each counterpart is a primary evidence but only against the parties executing it where a number of documents are all made by one uniform process as in the case of printing lithography or photography each is primary evidence of the contents of the rest but where they are all copies of a common original they are not primary evidence of the contents of the original so if suppose uh, 1000 copies of a book were printed so any one copy can be used as a primary evidence against all the other copies that were printed in the same batch so for example if something offensive is written in a book i can bring any copy of the book to the court as a primary evidence to prove that this offensive thing was written in this book but all this primary evidence refers to is all the books of that particular batch if something was made using photocopy so for instance if something was handwritten and after hand uh, after making a handwritten note somebody photocopied it and produced 1000 copies so each of these copies is a primary evidence against all of the other copies that were produced but is not a primary evidence 
of the original document because it is possible that the original document something else was written and before making the photocopy somebody made some changes but each of the photocopies is a primary evidence against all the other photocopies that were made so illustration a person is shown to have been in possession of a number of play cards all printed at one time from one original any one of the play cards is primary evidence of the contents of any other because they were all printed at the same time using the same process using the same original so each of these is a primary evidence of the contents of any other but no one of them is primary evidence of the contents of the original then section 63 deals with secondary evidence secondary evidence means and includes certified copies given under the provisions here and after contained so if there is a certified copy given by a public authority then we'll say that it is a, a secondary evidence so it's not the original document but it is a copy which has been certified to be true and the court will accept it as a secondary evidence copy is made from the original by mechanical processes which in themselves ensure the accuracy of the copy and copies compared with such copies copies made from and compared with the original counterparts of document as against the parties who did not execute them oral accounts of the contents of a document given by some person who has himself seen it so all of these are secondary evidences illustration a photograph of an original is a secondary evidence of its contents why because photography is a mechanical process and it ensures that whatever was there in front of it it is faithfully reproduced so it is a secondary evidence of the contents though the two have not been compared if it is proved that the thing photographed was the original so this thing has to be proved because if the thing that was photographed was itself fake then the photograph will not be taken as a secondary evidence so a photograph is a secondary evidence only when it is proved that the thing photographed was the original then section 64 deals with proof of documents by primary evidence documents must be proved by primary evidence except in the cases here and after mentioned so when we talk about documentary evidences they have to be proved by primary evidence except in the cases that are given so it means that if you talk about any document it has to be brought in original to the court so what are the exceptions cases in which secondary evidence relating to documents may be given secondary evidence may be given of the existence condition or contents of a document in the following cases when the original is shown or appears to be in possession of power of the person against whom the document is sought to be proved meaning that if there is a suit between a and b and the matter or the document in question is in possession of b and b is not bringing it to the court so in those situations a can produce a photocopy of the document and the court will accept it as a secondary evidence if the original is shown or appears to be in the possession of or power of the person against whom the document is sought to be proved or of any person out of reach or not subject to the process of the court so if the document is somebody who is residing in some other country is not subject to the process of the court so in that situation the uh, copy of the document may be used as a secondary evidence or of any person leg legally bound to produce it and when after the notice mentioned in section 66 such person does not produce it so if there is a person who is legally bound to produce the document in original but even after giving him the notice the person is not producing it so in those circumstances secondary evidences may be used when the existence condition or contents of the original have been proved to be admitted in writing by the person against whom it is proved or by his representative in interest or when the original has been destroyed or lost or when the party offering evidence of its contents cannot for any other reason not arising from his own default or neglect produce it in reasonable time so here the important thing is for any reason not arising from his own default or neglect 
So in those circumstances, the court may accept the secondary evidence. When the original is of such a nature as not to be easily movable. If the original is, for instance, an inscription written in the stone. So if it is an inscription written in a stone and it belongs to, to certain cave, so the court will not ask the person to cut that stone and bring it to the court. So in those circumstances, photographs of that inscription may be used as secondary evidences is what it is saying here. When the original is a public document within the meaning of section 74. So we'll look at public documents in a short while. When the original is a document of which a certified copy is permitted by this act or by any other law in force in India to be given in evidence. So if any act explicitly says that a certified copy is permitted, then the court will accept it. When the originals consist of numerous accounts or other documents which cannot conveniently be examined in court and the fact to be proved is the general result of the whole collection. So in all of these cases, secondary evidences may be used. Then section 65A talks about special provisions as to evidence relating to electronic record. Now as we can see 65A means that it was added later on. So special provisions as to evidence relating to electronic record, the contents of electronic records may be proved in accordance with the provisions of section 65B, which says notwithstanding anything contained in this act, any information contained in an electronic record which is printed on a paper, stored, recorded or copied in optical or magnetic media produced by a computer here and after referred to as the computer output shall be deemed to be also a document. That is, if you have stored something on a CD or on a hard drive, then it shall also be deemed to be a document. If the conditions mentioned in this section are satisfied in relation to the information and computer in question and shall be admissible in any proceedings without further proof or production of the original as evidence or any contents of the original or of any fact stated therein of which direct, admission, uh, direct evidence would not would be admissible. So what are these conditions? The conditions are the computer output containing the information was produced by the computer during the period over which the computer was used regularly to store or process information for the purposes of any activities regularly carried out on over that period by the person having lawful control over the use of the computer. That is, when you are talking about electronic records, the Indian Evidence Act is saying that the electronic record should have been produced by a computer that was working at that point of time and was being used by the same person who was making these documents and the computer was working fine. So all of these conditions have to be met, only then we will accept it as evidence. During the said period, information of the kind contained in the electronic record or of the kind from which the information so contained is derived was regularly fed into the computer in the ordinary course of the said activities. That is, if you are taking say a CCTV footage, so in that case the CCTV footage is regularly being fed into a machine and so any copy of that can be used as an evidence. But if you are only using CCTV to for one particular period of time, then the court might question about what is the preceding uh, footage, what is this, the succeeding footage, is what this is referring to. Throughout the material part of the said period, the computer was operating properly or if not, then in respect of any period in which it was not operating properly or was out of operation during that part of the period was not such as to affect the electronic record or the accuracy of its contents. So the system should have been operating properly, otherwise it would, it, it may result in corruption of the information. The information contained in the electronic record reproduces or is derived from such information fed into the computer in the ordinary course of the said activities. Which means everything has to be ordinary, we are not looking at extraordinary circumstances. So the person should have been in lawful control of the computer, the computer should have been working properly, it should have been used to get these information on a daily basis or on, on a routine manner. 
So in those cases, the electronic evidence is admissible. Where over any period, the function of storing or processing information for the purposes of any activities regularly carried on over the period, as mentioned in clause A of subsection 2, was regularly performed by the computers. So all of these are pertaining to how you are going to use electronic evidence. Then section 66 looks at rules as to notice to produce. So we saw before that if somebody has been given a notice under section 66 and is not producing that document, then a secondary evidence can be used. So what is section 66? It is rules as to notice to produce. Secondary evidence of the contents of documents referred to in section 65 Clause A shall not be given unless the party proposing to give such secondary evidence has previously given to the party on whose possession or power the document is or to his attorney or pleader such notice to produce it as is prescribed by law and if no notice is prescribed by law then such notice as the court considers reasonable under the circumstances of the case. So if there is a document with somebody you will have to give him a notice to produce that document. Provided that such notice shall not be required in order to render secondary evidence admissible in any of the following cases or in any case in which the court thinks fit to dispense with it. When the document to be proved is itself a notice, when from the nature of the court the adverse party must know that he will be required to produce it. So in these circumstances you do not have to give a notice under section 66. When it appears or is proved that the adverse party has obtained possession of the original by fraud or force, when the adverse party or his agent has the original in court, when the adverse party or his agent has admitted the loss of the document, when the person in possession of the document is out of reach of or not subject to the process of the court. So in these circumstances, this notice will not be served, otherwise it has to be followed. Then section 67 says proof of signature and handwriting of person alleged to have signed or written document produced. If a document is alleged to be signed or to have been written wholly or in part by any person, the signature or the handwriting of so much of the document as is alleged to be in that person's handwriting must be proved to be in his handwriting. So for instance, if you are submitting a document to the court and you are saying that this document was written by this person in his own handwriting. So it must be proved that yes, it was this person's handwriting. If you say that this document was signed by person X, then the signature must match the signature of person X. This is what this section is saying. Then section 67A says proof as to electronic signature, except in the case of a secure electronic signature, if the electronic signature of any subscriber is alleged to have been affixed to an electronic record. The fact that such electronic signature is the electronic signature of the subscriber must be proved. So as in the case of a handwritten signature, if there is an electronic signature, it must be proved that it belongs to the person uh, who, uh, who it, it is being said has signed it electronically, except in the case of a secure electronic signature where you do not need to prove that. <coughs> Then section 68 says proof of execution of document required by law to be attested. If a document is required by law to be attested, it shall not be used as evidence until one attesting witness at least has been called for the purpose of proving its execution. If there be an attesting witness alive and subject to the process of the court and capable of giving evidence. So if a document is required to be attested, then this document will only be used as an evidence if at least one attesting witness is called for the purpose of proving its execution. Except in the cases where nobody is living or subject to the process of the court and capable of giving evidence. Provided that it shall not be necessary to call an attesting witness in proof of the execution of any document not being a will which has been registered in accordance with the provisions of the Indian Registration Act 1908 unless its execution by the person by whom it purports to have been executed is specifically denied. So if there is a document that has been attested and then it also has been registered under the Indian Registration Act, so in those cases the court does not have to call the uh, witness. 
proof where no attesting witness found if no such attesting witness can be found or if the document purports to have been executed in the uk it must be proved that the attestation of one attesting witness at least is in his handwriting and the signature of the person executing the document is in the handwriting of that person so if you cannot call the person then it must be proved that the signature of the person who has signed as a witness is actually the signature of the of that particular person and the signature of the person who has executed this document is actually the signature of the person so if you cannot call the uh, the witness uh, for proving the document you should at least be able to prove that the signatures are genuine so this is what section 69 is saying then section 70 admission of execution by party to attested document the admission of a party to an attested document of its execution by himself shall be sufficient proof of its execution as against him though it be a document required by law to be attested that is if you are giving an evidence against yourself so in that case it will be uh, admitted the court will not say that you are uh, uh, you are falsifying section 71 says proof when attesting witness denies the execution if the attesting witness denies or does not recollect the execution of the document its execution may be proved by other evidence so basically if the witness had signed in the uh, witness signature but in the court the witness is saying that i do not remember having signed this document or if the witness says that no i have i did not sign uh, as a witness in those cases other proofs may be resorted to so the party can give other proofs to prove that yes this was this the signature of this particular person so this is what section 71 is saying if the attesting witness is denying or does not recollect the execution of the document its execution may be proved by other evidence then section 72 says proof of document not required by law to be attested so till now we were talking about documents that are required by law to be attested but an attested document not required by law to be attested may be proved as it was as if it was unattested then section 73 talks about comparison of signature writing or seal with others admitted or proved in order to ascertain whether a signature writing or seal is that of the person by whom it purports to have been written or made any signature writing or seal admitted or proved to the satisfaction of the court to have been written or made by that person may be compared with the one which is to be proved although that signature writing or seal has not been produced or proved for any other purpose meaning that if you if the court has to be satisfied that this document is correct then other signatures or writings or seals of that person may be produced and compared to prove that yes it is the handwriting or signature of, or seal of this particular person the court may direct any person present in court to write any words or figures for the purpose of enabling the court to compare the words or figures so written with any words or figures alleged to have been written by such person this section applies also with necessary modifications to finger impressions then section 73a says proof as to verification of digital signature so these days we are signing digitally and in order to ascertain whether a digital signature is that of the person by whom it purports to have been affixed the court may direct that the person or the controller or the certifying authority to produce the digital signature certificate so the dsc can be asked to be produced and any other person to apply the public key listed in the dsc and verify the digital signature purported to have been affixed by that person and for the purposes of this section controller means the controller appointed under subsection 1 of section 17 of the it act 2000 so in the case of digital signatures the court may ask for the dsc and may ask any other person to apply the public key listed in the dsc and verify the digital signature so this is how digital signatures are going to be 
proven in the court. Next, let us look at public documents. So, the following documents are public documents. Documents forming the acts or records of the acts of the sovereign authority, of official bodies and tribunals, and of public officers, legislative, judicial, and executive of any part of India or of the Commonwealth or of a foreign country. So, all of these documents that are acts or record of acts of all of these bodies, they are public documents. But also public records kept in any state of private documents. So, for example, if there is a memorandum of association that has been signed by persons who have made a company, but then this document has to be submitted and it is kept in the record, it is kept in the public record. So, in that case, that record will also be referred to as a public document. So, even though it is a private document signed by private parties, but because this memorandum of association is kept as a public record, so it will be deemed to be a public document. And anything that is not a public document is a private document. So, all other documents are private. Now, in the case of public documents, we have the provision of having the certified copies. Every public officer having the custody of a public document, which any person has a right to inspect, shall give that person on demand a copy of it on payment of the legal fees. Therefore, together with a certificate written at the foot of such copy that it is a true copy of such document or part thereof, as the case may be, and such certificate shall be dated and subscribed by that by such officer with his name and his official title and shall be sealed whenever such officer is authorized by law to make use of a seal and such copies so certified shall be called certified copies. So, section 76 is explaining what is a certified copy. So, if there is a public document with a public authority, then any person can ask that public authority to give a certified copy of that document, in which case the public authority will take a copy of the document and then sign it, put his seal, put his title and that uh, and there will be a certificate that is saying that it is so, uh, so it will be certified and then it becomes a certified copy. Now, these days with the advent of RTI, we are getting routinely applications to get certified copies of such and such documents. So, this section enables people to get certified copies, but RTI has made this, this process much more simpler. So, in RTI, you only have to uh, put up an application with a fees of 10 rupees if you are above the poverty line and with no fees if you are below the poverty line and for each uh, page of uh, a certified copy, you are charged 2 rupees if you are above the poverty line and it is given free of charge if you are below the poverty line. So, RTI has strengthened this provision, but this provision has been provided by the Indian Evidence Act. Then explanation, any officer who by the ordinary course of official duty is authorized to deliver such copies shall be deemed to have the custody of such documents within the meaning of this section. So, even if it is not in physical custody of that officer, but if the officer in course of his official duty is authorized to deliver such copies, then we will mean or we will say that these documents are in the custody of that officer. And a very similar thing happens with the public information officer as well. So, a public information officer is deemed to have the custody of the documents that he has to provide under RTI. So, there are very close parallels between this section and the RTA. Then section 77 talks about proof of documents by production of certified copies. Such certified copies may be produced in proof of the contents of the public documents or parts of the public documents of which they purport to be copies. So, certified copies can be used as proof. And this is why there is a distinction between public and private documents. Then section 78 talks about proof of other official documents. The following public documents may be proved as follows. Acts, orders or notifications of the central government, 
in any of its departments or of the crown representative or of any state government or any department of any uh, state government by the records of the departments certified by the head of those departments respectively or by any document purporting to be printed by order of such government. So, the HOD of the department can also certify that this copy is correct. The proceedings of the legislatures by the journals of those bodies respectively or by published acts or abstracts or by copies purported to be printed by order of the government concerned and so on. So, basically uh, this section is saying that uh, for the other public documents or for other official documents that are not deemed to be public documents also you can ask for copies by different persons or by making use of the notifications or the official publications and then they can also be used as evidence in the court. Next we look at presumptions as to documents. So, section 79 says presumption as to the genuineness of certified copies. So, if a person has submitted a certified copy, then will the court ask if the certification is correct or not is what the, the, uh, this particular section is asking. So, there is a presumption as to the genuineness of the certified copies. The court shall presume and we have seen before shall presume means has to presume, it must presume to be genuine every document purporting to be a certificate, certified copy or other document which is by law declared to be admissible as evidence of any particular fact and which purports to be duly certified by any officer of the central government or the state government. Provided that such document is substantially in the form and purports to be executed in the manner directed by law in that behalf. And the court shall also presume that any officer by whom any such document purports to be signed or certified held when he signed it the official character which he claims in such paper. That is, if there is a certified copy produced before the court, the court will presume that the certificate is correct and the officer who is saying that yes, I was authorized to sign it, he was, he is also saying the correct thing. So, this is to be presumed until and unless it is proven otherwise. Then section 80 deals with presumption as to documents produced as record of evidence. When any document is produced before any court purporting to be a record or memorandum of the evidence or of any part of the evidence given by a witness in a judicial proceeding before or uh, before any officer authorized by law to take such evidence or to be a statement or confession by any prisoner or accused person taken in accordance with law and purporting to be signed by any judge or magistrate or any or by any such officer as aforesaid, the court shall presume that the document is genuine that the statements as to the circumstances under which it was taken purporting to be made by the person signing it are true and that such evidence statement or confession was duly taken. So, if you are giving evidence statement or confession that was duly taken by uh, the authorized officer or by the court, then the court will, uh, will presume it to be correct. Presumption as to gazette, newspaper, private acts of parliament and other documents. So, these will also be presumed to be correct until proven otherwise. Presumption as to gazettes in electronic forms, the court shall presume the genuineness of every electronic record purporting to be the official gazette. Presumption as to maps or plans made by authority of government, here also the court will presume them to be correct. Presumption as to collection of laws and reports of decisions, the court shall presume the genuineness of every book purporting to be printed or published under the government under the authority of the government of any country and to contain any of the laws of that country and every book purporting to contain reports of the decisions of the court of such country. So, all of these documents are presumed to be genuine. Presumption as to powers of attorney, the court shall presume that every document purporting to be a power of attorney and to have been executed before and authenticated by a notary public or any court, judge, magistrate, Indian consul or voice counsel or representative of the central government was so executed and authenticated. 
presumption as to electronic signatures here also the same thing presumption as to electronic records and electronic signatures presumptions as to electronic signature certificates presumption as to certified copies of foreign judicial records now in the case of foreign judicial records it says uh, that the court may presume so in this case it is not shall presume it is may presume that any document purporting to be a certified copy of any judicial record of any country not forming a part of India is genuine and accurate if the, the document purports to be certified in any manner which is certified by any representative of the central government in or for such country to be uh, the manner commonly in use in that country for the certification of copies of judicial records. So in this case it is the court may presume not shall presume. Then presumption as to books, maps and charts here also the court may presume. Presumption as to telegraphic messages the court may presume them to be correct. But uh, the court shall not make any presumption as to the person by whom such message was delivered for transmission. Next presumption as to electronic messages here also the, uh, the court may presume it to be correct. Presumption as to execution etc of documents not presumed the court shall presume that every document called for and not produced after notice to produce was attested stamped and executed in the manner required by law. So if the court is asking for a document but this document has is not being produced by the party then the court shall presume it has to presume that the document was correct it was attested stamped and executed in the manner required by law. Then section 90 says presumption as to documents 30 years old if there are old documents then what to do where any document purporting or proved to be 30 years old is produced from any custody which the court in the particular case considers proper the court may presume here also it's may presume that the signature and every other part of such document which purports to be in the handwriting of any particular person is in that person's handwriting and in the case of a document executed or attested that it was duly executed and attested by the persons by whom it purports to be executed and attested. So if it is an old document then the court does not have to ask for the witnesses it may presume that everything is correct. But the important thing here is that the document should be in proper custody and documents are said to be in proper custody if they are in the place in which and under the care of the person with whom they would naturally be. But no custody is improper if it is proved to have had a legitimate origin or if the circumstances of the particular case are such as to render such an origin probable. So illustration. A has been in possession of landed property for a long time. He produces from his custody deeds relating to the land showing his titles to it. So in this case the court will say that the custody is proper because in the normal course a person would be in custody of the deeds relating to his lands. And so the custody is proper and so this document may be presumed to be correct. Then section 90A says presumption as to electronic records 5 years old where any electronic record purporting or proved to be 5 years old is produced from any custody which the court in the particular case considers proper the court may presume that the electronic signature which purports to be the electronic signature of any particular person was so affixed by him or any person authorized by him in this behalf. So for old documents and for old electronic records the court may presume that the documents are correct if they have been in a proper custody that is this is what these sections are telling us. Then chapter 6 deals with of the exclusion of oral by documentary evidence, evidence of terms of contracts, grants and other dispositions of property reduced to form of document. So in certain cases you can have oral evidence as well as documentary evidence. So this section is saying that if there is a documentary evidence then it will be having more uh, relevance as compared to the oral uh, evidence. 
So, evidence of terms of contracts, grants and other dispositions of property reduced to the form of document. When the terms of contract, grant or any disposition of property have been reduced to the form of a document and in all cases in which any matter is required by law to be reduced to the form of a document, no evidence shall be given in proof of terms of such contract, grant or other disposition of property or of such matter except the document itself or secondary evidence of its contents in cases in which secondary evidence is admissible under the provisions herein before contained. So, if there is a contract or grant or other disposition of property that has to be reduced to the form of a document. So, there has to be a paper because it is required by law that all of these should be written down. So, in these cases, no other uh, evidence will be admissible. The only thing that is admissible is either the original document as a primary evidence or a secondary evidence if the secondary evidence is admissible. So, you can not just ask people to say about the document, you will have to produce the document or its copy. Now, here we have certain exceptions. When a public officer is required by law to be appointed in writing and when it is shown that any particular person has acted as such officer, the writing by which he is appointed need not be proved. And wills admitted to probate in India may be proved by the probate. So, these are the two exceptions. Now, let us look at some illustrations here. If a contract be contained in several letters, all the letters in which it is contained must be proved. If a contract is contained in a bill of exchange, the bill of exchange must be proved. If a bill of exchange is drawn in a set of three, only one need be proved and so on. Then exclusion of evidence of oral agreement. When the terms of such of any such contract, grant or other disposition of property or any matter required by law to be reduced to the form of a document have been proved according to the last section, no evidence of any oral agreement or a statement shall be admitted. So, once you have proved the document, no evidence of any oral agreement or statement shall be admitted. As between the parties to such to any such instrument or their representatives in interest for the purpose of contradicting, varying, adding to subtracting and so on. For example, A agrees absolutely in writing to pay B 1000 rupees on the 1st of March 1873. So, it is given in writing that A will give to B 1000 rupees on 1st of March 1873. Now, the fact that at the same time an oral agreement was made that the money should not be paid till the 31st March cannot be proved. So, you cannot use an oral evidence to counter this documentary evidence that has been proved. Exclusion of evidence to explain or amend ambiguous document. When the language used in a document is on its face ambiguous or defective, then evidence may not be given of the facts which would show its meaning or supply its defects. That is, if the document itself is confusing, it is using an ambiguous or defective language, then you cannot give evidence of uh, a fact which would show its meaning. For example, A agrees in writing to sell a horse to B for 1000 or 1500. So, in this case, the agreement in writing itself is defective because it is unclear whether it is 1000 or 1500. So, in such cases, evidence cannot be given to show which price was to be given. So, the document has to be made properly. Exclusion of evidence against application of document to existing facts. When the language used in a document is plain in itself and when it applies accurately to existing facts, evidence may not be given to show that it was not meant to apply to such facts. So, if the language is correct, then you cannot give evidence to show that it was not meant to apply to these facts. For example, A sells to B by deed my estate at Rampur containing 100 bigas. And so, A is selling to B with a deed, so it is a written document, his estate at Rampur containing 100 bigas. Now, A has an estate at Rampur and this estate also contains 100 bigas. 
so this document is on plain reading a correct document now in this case evidence may not be given of the fact that the estate meant to be sold was once situated at a different place and of a different size so these evidences will not be taken in the proof evidence as to document unmeaning reference to existing facts when the language used in uh, a document is plain in itself but is unmeaning in reference to the existing facts then evidence may be given to show that it was used in a peculiar case or a peculiar sense so for example a sells to b by deed my house in calcutta but it turns out that a does not have a house in calcutta but he does have a house in havra and havra is very close to calcutta of which b had been in possession since the execution of the deed so these facts may be proved to show that the deed as such related to the house at havra and not to the house in calcutta because in this case the person did not have a house in calcutta he had a house in havra he sold a house in calcutta so in this case it is possible that he was referring to the same house as being in calcutta because they are very close by and in such cases evidence may be given to show that the deed related to the house at havra evidence as to application of language which can apply to one only of several persons when the facts are such that the language used might have been meant to apply to any one and could not have been meant to apply to more than one of several things evidence may be given of facts which show which of those persons or things it was intended to apply to so for example a agrees to sell to b for 1000 rupees my white horse but it turns out that a has two white house horses so in such cases evidence may be given of facts which show which of them was meant because he want he ag had agreed to sell his white horse so only one horse had to be sold so out of these two horses which horse had to be sold can be uh, proved by giving evidence a agrees to accompany b to hyderabad now we have one hyderabad in the deccan and we have one hyderabad in pakistan so which of these hyderabads was a referring to it may be proved because we have more than one hyderabad and the agreement only talks about one hyderabad so which of these is the correct one it may be proved evidence as to application of language to one of two sets of facts to neither of which the whole correctly applies so if a agrees to sell to b his land at x and in the occupation of y now a has land at x but not in the occupation of y and he has land in the occupation of y but it is not at x so in such cases where both of these things are not correct in those cases evidence may be given of facts showing which he meant to sell evidence as to meaning of illegible characters evidence may be given to show the meaning of illegible or not commonly intelligible characters of foreign obsolete technical local or uh, provisional expressions of expressions and of words used in the peculiar sense for example a is agreeing to sell to b all his mods now there is no such word as mods so a could have referred to both his models and his modeling tools so in this case evidence may be given to show what he meant actually who may give ev evidence of agreement uh, varying terms of the document persons who are not parties to a document or their representatives in interest may give evidence of any facts tending to show a contemporaneous agreement varying the terms of the document so if a and b make a contract in writing that b shall sell a certain cotton to be paid for on delivery and at the same time they make an oral agreement that 3 months credit shall be given to a now this could not be shown as between a and b but it might be shown by c if it affected his interests so a third party can give these evidences and saving of provisions of indian succession act relating to wills nothing in this chapter contained shall be taken to affect any of the provisions of the indian succession act 1865 as to the construction of wills so basically the indian evidence act is trying to tell us 
what is an admissible evidence, what is not an admissible evidence, what can be proved, what cannot be proved and so on. So that's all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.